everybody. Matt here. Uh, as we are providing more resources for you um, on our socially distant worship collective page, um, a couple of us were talking about some um, devotional topics and some uh, video ideas. And so I'm going to be hosting um, a series about worship, of course. Um, the most commonly asked question um, that I get asked as a worship leader is how do you choose songs? Um, what goes into planning a, a worship service? And um, how do you keep them in context with each other and with the message? Of course, there's some technical things um, that we have to do on our end, which is, um, you know, choosing keys uh, and determining if songs have a singable melody and all of those kinds of things. But as we dive deeper into the question, um, we really get down to the heart of the concern, which I think is a legitimate concern. And that is, um, how do you know that songs, or let's just say any artistry or mode of worship, how do you know that um, it's biblical and that it's good, that uh, it pleases God? And I think that that is a legitimate question to consider. Um, it isn't the first time that um, a question like that has been asked. Um, we know that there has been a long time, um, I don't really know if controversy is a good word, but a long time discussion about whether, uh, say, traditional hymns from a certain period of time um, and their strong doctrinal messages are better, um, or if um, contemporary worship songs uh, with their freedom and um, their um, contemplations, are, are they better? With things uh, like connectivity via social media, you know, this takes these private conversations and, uh, and sort of makes them more public. And now what you see are conversations and questions like um, if there's a church that does something um, um, new or maybe um, something that they preach or teach, um, like a little sound bite on the internet um, taken out of context of a message um, makes the church sound like they're, they're teaching strange things. And maybe they have a band that uh, pumps out albums. There's a conversation going on now that, uh, you know, we shouldn't be singing the, their songs because then we endorse them and we financially support them and we publicize them. So this isn't really a new kind of conversation, nor do I think that um, it's a trivial one. I think it's a legitimate concern because, like everything in life, we should, as Christians, be asking, does this please God? Is this good? Um, and so I want to turn our attention to a text uh, in um, Romans chapter 6. Paul um, is writing and talks about um, spiritual freedom. He's, he's kind of, there's a lot of good doctrine in the book of Romans, and he, he hits a lot of general points. But this particular section is about uh, what does it mean when we say things like we're free in Christ. And I think that whenever we pull out the core of the message in Romans chapter 6 and some in chapter 7, we'll be able to begin answering this question. So I'm starting in verse 15 of Romans chapter 6. What then are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of your natural limitations, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, which leads to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. So I find it interesting that Paul says, um, that at one time we were slaves to sin and are now slaves to righteousness. At one time being slaves to sin, the truth is, is that uh, we 
didn't even really know that we were enslaved to sin. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes to them and says that the God of this world has um, blinded our minds, our eyes to the glory of God. So we, uh, sin being our master, we don't even really know that sin is our master. We don't, that's how we're enslaved to sin. We believe that we're, we have a freedom to make choices um, in a sinful nature. Oh, well, you know, I'm just having fun or whatever. You know, we're, we're seeking pleasure. And uh, we think that it's a choice to pursue that comfort or that pleasure. But Paul writes, no, in actuality, you're a slave to those compulsions. And now, uh, having been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, that is Jesus Christ, we use terms like, well, I'm free in Christ. And that is true, but Paul chooses in this context to say that we are slaves to righteousness. That means that the same compulsions that we had to seek comfort and pleasure and indulge in those things, leading to more lawlessness, in that same way that those were compulsions, now being filled with the Holy Spirit, there is a compulsion to righteousness. It's not like a moral conscience, it's the Holy Spirit leading us into battle against sin. And so our behavior in righteousness is a compulsion being a byproduct of the Holy Spirit or more expanded upon the fruit of the Spirit as, as we tend to call it. Looking over in chapter 7 of Romans, starting in verse 4. My brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. So that's, that's Jesus. We belong to Jesus that we bear fruit for God, or the fruit of the Spirit. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused or stimulated, um, having our, our sinful passions, having a light shone on them by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So Paul um, in 1 Corinthians also uses an example of marriage to help us understand um, how we are both free in Christ and enslaved to righteousness. And he uses um, a picture of marriage by saying, okay, well, when somebody gets married, we say the phrase, till death do us part. When a spouse dies, they're no, they're no longer married to that spouse. Um, a, a, a way that I teach students about what it means to be enslaved to Christ, enslaved to righteousness and free in Christ is this. Um, it's like if I tell um, my, my child, you know, don't go outside and eat dirt. Well, if she's really young, that might be a compulsion. You know, she doesn't understand what she's doing. But as she grows and hopefully grows in wisdom, um, maybe she's in her, she's a teenager. And I say the same thing. Don't go outside and go eat dirt. Well, her, her compulsions, her nature are, are going to fall into alignment with that. All right. So she's free not to eat dirt like she did whenever she was a toddler, per se, all right? You know, little kids, they go to the beach and they just put things in their mouth, right? Super gross. Um, but when they're older, their compulsions or um, their, their nature falls into alignment with that rule so that they don't necessarily have to try to hold that law, hold that rule and and and. and perform well in it. Their nature compels them to do it already. This is kind of a, it's a, it's a simplistic picture, but I think that it's a good way to kind of understand how, how there is a freedom in Christ and an enslavement to righteousness, both going hand in hand, that our natures, whenever uh, we are producing fruit of the spirit, they, they fall into alignment or to con into conformity with God's word. And so our compulsions like our compulsions in our old nature caused us to sin, leading to more lawlessness, or as read in chapter 7, we're bearing fruit to death. Um, now our compulsions in righteousness are bearing fruit for God. So what does this have to do with song choice? Well, I think that 
Um, you know, as I, as I put together a worship service personally, there, are, there like I said, there are a couple of technical elements, but there is a context in which I think, and, and that is that I am allowed a freedom and a discernment. So in 1 Corinthians, as I mentioned earlier, Paul um, addresses a bunch of issues that um, the Corinthians were dealing with having to do with just daily life, you know, how they were to dress, the kind of stuff they were supposed to eat. There was just so much um, little nuggets of what felt like wisdom circulating amongst their church that Paul wrote them and, and was addressing those things they had questions about. And one of them was uh, food, for example. They, they had written him and were confused about, well, you know, if, if food is sacrificed to idols and we know that there is only one true God— and, and it's just food, does it really damage us? And Paul answers back and says, you're right, no, it's, it, is just food. it is just food, and um, it, there is only one God. But if there is a, a spiritually weaker brother, or maybe a way you can think about it is a, a less mature Christian who they struggle with this concept of idolatry and understanding that there aren't many gods, there's one God, and they witness you consuming food casually that's been sacrificed to idols, then you've sinned against them, and so you've sinned against God. Now, this has to do with a lot of different things, but in the context of what we're talking about with song choice, there is a context in which I have to think. Sometimes it is um, trying to make things, honestly, universally accessible but not so diluted that we get rid of the, the gospel and the message and teaching that Jesus is Lord and that he has um, saved us from sin and we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit, that God the Father being the one true God, you know, all of those things, obviously we're not going to dilute the message so much and be so universally accessible, but we do want to make it in such a way that we don't, quote, sin against our brothers. And there are some songs out there that are very specific and, and honestly very good. You and I, as Christians, have the freedom to use them to worship God when they point to God. But picking songs in a church setting or in a corporate setting, as I'm going to use uh, a term I'm going to use, a corporate setting, there is a context to think about. But there is always one primary context that I think of, and that is, who is God? What is he like? Um, what does he think about us? And what, what are we supposed to draw from his actions about his nature? There's all of those kinds of things. We have a term for that question. It's called theology. Theology is, yes, the study or the understanding of who God is. And quite frankly, many people find theology to be a boring concept that it's something for seminary professors and, and doctors to just think about and ponder in their, in their offices and um, you know, present us with books that we can read. But the thing is, though, is that I challenge you to maybe, if you find theology a boring thing, I, I challenge you to reconsider that because Jesus does, did not die on the cross and allow us a relationship and access to God the Father for us to see him and be bored by who he is. Theology, yes, can sound like a boring word, but there is nothing boring about knowing who God is and studying who God is. So how can we know who God is? The answer is very easy and very simple. Study your Bible. If you study your Bible, God's word, you will know more about God's heart. One of the things that I have to pray whenever I study my Bible is um, that, I, God, I need help um, understanding what I'm reading because I'm going to get very distracted or maybe I'm going to bring something to the scripture that, that is not meant to be there. That's a, ter a term called um, eisegesis. It's whenever I study my Bible, and I read through it and I, I pick things out of context and I try and frame them to justify how my life is already. That's called eisegesis. The way to study your Bible correctly is called exegesis. And that is to do, or quite the opposite. That is to read God's word 
and then frame my life, filter my perspective of what I think is going on in my life and in the world around me through what I read in Scripture. So eisegesis is, um, con is contextualizing Scripture according to my life, and exegesis is contextua contextualizing my life according to Scripture. Exegesis is the good way to read your Bible and study your Bible. <laughs> so I need help with exegetical scripture reading or else I'm going to contrive a version of God's nature that is not in his word. All of this has to do with choosing songs in this way. I personally never want to lead a song or sing a song and, and lead us in worship um, in a way that presents God in a manner that he has not presented himself. I don't want to um, like I said, create this version of God and contrive this nature of God that is not in Scripture that, and, is, and it doesn't line up with what we know about him. So to answer our first question, how do you choose songs for worship? Well, that is the main filter that I look through. I ask, you know, who is God? And I, and I look at um, song choices and even the stuff that I write. I write some things and sometimes when I'm done writing, I look at it and I go, I don't really know if that's as scripturally sound as I initially thought it was. And I kind of toss it to the side or maybe I readdress it, rewrite some words. Um, so that is the primary question to know um, not just what songs does Matt choose, not that I choose them perfectly, nor do I believe that there is a perfect set list, you know, that there is the right song to sing all the time. The right song is the one that God chooses or God impresses. And, and then, you know, you come to a service and we sing it together and God moves on your heart. That's what makes it the right song. It's not that Matt chose it or Pastor Russell likes it. Although, you know, that's, it's good if Pastor Russell likes them, I suppose. Uh, but uh, that's what makes it a good song, a right song, is that, um, you know, we sing it together, God moves on your heart, but that has to work hand in hand with your personal Bible study. Because um, we can create sort of a group hype in a, in a worship setting surrounding um, a contrived nature of God that might be biblically sound, but if you don't study it for yourself, you don't really have a great sense of who you're worshiping. If you're not progressing and developing in your walk with Christ by studying your Bible, having a quiet time, um, even fasting as well, your worship um, could be misaligned. It, it could not, if you don't know who God is and what he's like by reading his word, how do you know that the things, uh, how, are you, how are you framing the things that you're singing? You'll notice in worship services and as well on the online videos that I post a, uh, a, a little chunk of scripture before every song. And, and this is precisely why I want to make sure that um, we all, including myself, have this scriptural framework that we're looking through as we approach songs. And that way, the Holy Spirit um, can use them in a manner where uh, it goes in both directions, where when we sing the song, Maybe God brings to mind that scripture that you've been studying. Or when you study that scripture, God brings to mind that song that we've been singing. And it helps. They, they work hand in hand. Now, of course, we know that worship is more than just corporate singing and, and, and songs and music. But that's the one that we're talking about in this session. And so this week, I want to challenge you. Uh, maybe as you prepare for this upcoming weekend's songs, ask the Holy Spirit, to help you read and study scripture. And then whenever we sing together, ask him to bring to mind the things that you've studied so that as you sing, it's being prompted and accelerated by God's word and not exclusively by a good melody or loud songs or a group hype, but that it's God's word, that that's what you can rest on, what God has said as we sing together. And I promise you, it's so much sweeter. So Bible study and worship go hand in hand. One without the other 
sort of dilutes the other. Meaning, if I, if I love having a, a worship time and, I, and maybe a private time or I love going to corporate worship services and settings, nights of worship, those kinds of things, right? And I love participating in them, but I don't have a strong theological foundation and understanding of who God is by reading his word and spending time with him. Then how do I know who I'm worshiping? And then vice versa, if I'm, if I'm studying my Bible and the Holy Spirit is lifting the veil off my mind and Jesus is working inside of me and he's changing me, but I don't have this overwhelming humble response to God's glory. I don't savor it and I don't rejoice in it. It doesn't lead me to respond. Then what good is all of this information? What good is it in my own life? Of course, the information is good, but what good is it if it's not being responsively applied? You're, you can tune in um, every Friday night at 7. Um, that's when we're going to be posting um, this, uh, these sessions in this series. Next week, um, I'm going to be answering a different question uh, that I get asked a lot. So, you know, we talked about, all right, so worship and, and Bible study go hand in hand. Well, I, I got a good sense of what, what, what it means to study my Bible, but what is worship? You know, what, what exactly is it? How does God see it? That's going to be um, uh, one of the things that we discuss next week. What is worship? I encourage you to look at um, a, a couple of materials that I'm going to be um, using. One of them is called uh, Reading the Bible Supernaturally by John Piper. That's going to be one of the main resources that I uh, use and I refer to in helping us understand um, including myself at times, help, helping us all understand uh, the relationship between Bible study and worship. Another book that I'm going to be uh, referring to is called Holiness by J.C. Ryle. Um, it is a collection of essays that J.C. Ryle uh, wrote a long time ago, talking about um, the nature of holiness, the hindrances to holiness, the difficulties in the pursuit of holiness, and the roots of holiness. Uh, another uh, smaller piece of material that I'm going to reference is um, Holy Roar by Chris Tomlin. So check out those three books. They're all three very good. Um, take a look at them, uh, and hopefully they will be as encouraging and supplemental for you as they were and are for me. Uh, like I said, you can tune in every Friday at 7. I will be praying for you, uh, you all, uh, as we... Um, continue in our time of quarantine, being socially distant. Uh, I hope that uh, this tonight's session and uh, the continuing series is going to be um, an encouraging thing for you. I always look forward uh, to getting a moment uh, to just kind of share what God's teaching me and, um, and all of those sorts of things. So I hope this was encouraging for you. Uh, like I said, I challenge you this week um, to uh, incorporate some Bible study into your worship and some worship into your Bible study and help and ask God to help you understand the relationship between the two as we prepare for this Sunday's messages. I love you all. Hope to see you soon.